Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, whatever the time of day, you're most welcome. This is a new video that's designed to teach theme one, section 1.1.2, positive and normative economic statements. This is a relatively easy topic, so we should have time to examine the role that value judgments play in influencing economic decision making. This is on the specification two economics that can be proven to be true or false via an examination of the relevant facts. More formally, positive statements are refutable. Positive statements can be about the past, the present or the future. Let's take a look at some examples of positive economic statements. Uh, the first statement relates to the past and it's on the screen just now. Over the last decade, more than 25% of London pubs have closed down. That's a statement that we're going to consider. This is clearly an example of a positive economic statement because it's refutable. We can fact check it. Using tax records, we can easily ascertain whether this statement is true or false. We could uh, look and see whether a quarter of London's pubs have or have not closed down in the last decade. Um, this is a matter of fact, not a matter of opinion, therefore it's positive. The next positive statement that's on the screen pertains to the present and it says the average per capita income in Britain is higher than in Finland. This again is a positive economic statement because we can examine it relative to the facts. In Britain, the average person earns approximately $45,000 per year. In comparison, the average Finn earns $48,000 a year, so higher. That means that in this case, the statement is false. However, that fact doesn't mean that this statement isn't positive. Positive statements are refutable. That's what makes them positive. They are capable of being, being proven to be true or false. In this case, we have an example of an incorrect, positive economic statement. The last statement that's on the slide now concerns the future. And it says, the money printed by the Bank of England in April 2020 will cause UK inflation to rise in 2021. Inflation is a sustained increase in the general price level. To calculate it, the government works out the annual average percentage increase in the price level. Again, this statement is definitely one that is positive. This is because it's testable. In a year's time, we'll be able to collect the inflation data and see whether inflation increased or decreased. One year on from now, we'll know whether this positive statement was true or false. In contrast, normative statements aren't verifiable. You can't prove them to be true or false. This is because normative statements are based on subjective value judgments. They relate to opinions rather than to objective facts that can be tested and proven to be true or false. Normative economics then is about opinions. It concerns subjective views about what should happen or what ought to be. People have got different opinions. Therefore, normative economic statements are incapable of being proven to be either true or false. The statement the rich should pay higher taxes to help the poor is an example of a normative statement. This is because it's an opinion rather than a statement of fact. Some people argue that it's fair for the rich to keep the money that they've earned from helping others. On the other hand, socialists on others on the left might argue, well, I don't agree with this statement. I believe that the government has a moral duty to help the poor um, by in effect taking from the rich to give to the poor. 
this isn't a matter of fact, it's an opinion. Um, this statement makes the judgment that the poor deserve a higher living standard and that the rich ought to pay for it. When our values come into the analysis, we enter the realm of normative economics. Climate change activist groups deal in normative economics. They favour taxing air travel. Um, in their view, uh, it's needed uh, because it's going to make the world better, because we're going to face cataclysmic climate change. Um, the following statement on the screen is an example of a normative statement. And it says, taxes on air travel should go up. The giveaway here that it's a normative statement is should in italics, because it implies that it's a matter of opinion. Uh, what's the goal here? Why are we increasing taxes on air travel? Is it to save the environment? Is it to stop young people from traveling to Greece in the summertime, meeting up and having fun? Um, what right does somebody have to say, well, that the, my subjective view on climate change is more important than your desire to go on holiday? Um, it's, it's all about opinions at the end of the day. So the second statement, again, is, is normative. Reducing emissions is more important than your foreign holiday. Um, this isn't a fact, it's an opinion. Therefore, it's normative. Uh, those on the left frequently try to assert that their opinions are facts, when in fact, they're just subjective viewpoints. The world of value judgments is the world in which individual preferences are at issue. Each of us has a desire for different things. We've got different values, that's why. When we express a value judgment, we're simply saying what we prefer, like or desire. Since individual values are quite diverse, we expect and indeed observe people expressing widely varying value judgments about how the world should or ought to be. So if you look at the uh, picture on the screen there, you've got, I guess, vegans or animal rights people. They hold very, very strong opinions about not eating meat. Um, in a civilised society, though, you could argue that those people should be allowed to express their normative subjective opinions. However, those people should not be allowed to take the law into their own hands and physically stop other people from eating meat. Indeed, this picture causes me some, some concern. These people are demonstrating in a private place on somebody else's private property. If the supermarket is fine with that, fair enough. Uh, however, if the supermarket wanted to remove them from their private property, um, that would be perfectly fine in my opinion. People should have the right to peacefully demonstrate, providing that they're doing it in a public place and they're not stopping other people from going about their business. That's what it means to live in a civilized society, respecting the views of others, even if you might happen to disagree with those views. That's what tolerance means. So we'll now turn our attention to the role of value judgments in influencing economic decision making and policy. I think that it would be useful to distinguish between how values can affect individual decision making and then compare this against how value judgments might affect the government's economic decision making. So let's start off with individuals. Individuals are unique. Each of us is the only example of us that will ever exist. So we all have different values. So we'll all have, um, well, many different opinions. And also those opinions might cause us to make very different decisions. Societies and subgroups within societies have different cultures. The word culture in this context describes the ideas, customs, and social behavior of a particular group of people. 
The value judgments that underpin group norms can de definitely affect economic decision making. There's no better example than the role of women in the workforce. In some parts of the world, women aren't expected to take up paid work. They're expected to stay at home and produce babies and do childcare. In other parts of the world, the role of women in society is very, very different. And that leads to very different economic decisions being made. Uh, for example, uh, if women earn more money themselves, they'll be able to make more purchasing decisions. If women are expected to get involved in politics, or they can get involved in politics, this will also have a huge impact on economic decision making. So this is yet again a, a situation where culture can have a huge impact on economic decisions and it all stems back to value judgments. Value judgments about what's expected and what's not expected, what you can and can't do. Time preference is, is another uh, example of um, a value that can impact on economic decision making. People who have a, a high time preference aren't prepared to wait. They want it all now, in effect. In contrast, people that have a low time preference are more patient and they're prepared to postpone their gratification in return for a bigger reward at some point in the future. There's no right or wrong when it comes to time preference. Your time preference is your subjective opinion. However, your time preference will certainly affect your decision making. For example, in Asia, the culture is such that people have a very low time preference. In China, households save approximately half of their disposable incomes. That in indicates a very, very low time preference. Meanwhile, in Britain, values are quite different. Our preference is to have it all now and to use debt to achieve that. So this difference in values uh, causes UK households to accumulate debt and not many of them have much in the bank by way of savings. This again proves that values can have a huge bearing on the day-to-day -day economic decisions made by households. So yep, the chart speaks for itself. Um, so debt levels in Britain keep on, keep on rising. So the average Brit, 25% um, of their disposable income is, is uh, taken up with debt. Did you know that politicians spend over 40 pence of every pound that's earned in Britain? This, this statistic suggests that the value judgments of a handful of people in society are extremely important. And these people are politicians. They have an awful lot of our money to spend. So their values determine how our money is going to be spent. They have a huge influence over economic decision making. Therefore, their values are extremely important in, in determining how our money is spent. So let's look at some different values that politicians might have. Collectivists like Stalin and Hitler emphasise the importance of the group over the self. Individuals in a collectivist society are expected to sacrifice their dreams, goals, desires, and even their lives for the greater social good. The greater social good, of course, being defined by the dictator that runs the collectivist society. So again, it's really important to know what the values are of the people at the top of your society because it's going to have a huge influence on the type of decisions made. The collectivist mindset results in a highly centralised form of economic decision making. Under both fascism and socialism, 
individuals are left with very little economic decision-making power. Instead, they're expected to submit, submit to the will of the big, all-powerful state. Left-wing collectivists send those that refuse to obey their power to gulags. Fascist dictators send their dissident dissidents to concentration camps. The result was the same, mass murder. As you might imagine, I'm not a fan of collectivism and the big state model. Watch out for potential dictators who want to impose their values on you. These people have their own subjective visions of what they imagine utopia to be. And using the power of the state, they'll, they'll create this utopia for you. Mises had this exactly right. He who is in unfit to serve his fellow citizen seeks to rule them. Individualism is the opposite of collectivism. There is no collective mind or body or purpose. In an individualistic society, government is far smaller. People can choose how they earn their income and they also get to choose how they're going to spend the income that they've earned through helping others. So this is a society that emphasises uh, freedom and choice. Unfortunately, in my opinion, collectivism seems to be on the rise again. People like Greta Thunberg seem to believe that individuals currently have far too much economic decision-making power. Far too many of you are doing outrageous things like choosing to go on foreign holidays. People like Greta advocate a transfer of decision-making power from the individual to the state. You can't be trusted, you see, to make decisions that Greta thinks are needed to create Greta's subjective assessment of what utopia amounts to. And so we've come to the end of another economics video. So, in the words of Bugs Bunny, that's all folks.